that's not a financial plan. What makes up that five or six thousand dollars? I mean, what about health care costs? Yeah, retirement? that's huge. What about taxation? That's huge. Those are the two biggest wealth eroding factors facing people in retirement: are taxes yeah. and health care. So, until you truly understand someone, you don't know how to build that plan. Starting your route to retirement. Welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. I'm your host, Dean Barber. Joining me today is Logan DeGrave, Certified Financial Planner. Logan and I today are going to break down the elements of a comprehensive financial plan. It's far more detailed than what most people think, and it's far greater and far deeper than just your investments. Please enjoy my conversation with Logan DeGrave, Certified Financial Planner here on the Guided Retirement Show. Before we hop into today's episode, I want to remind our listeners and viewers that you can access the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients on your own time and all from the comfort of your own home. All you need to do is visit the link in the show notes and click the start planning button. From there, you can start building your retirement plan, no cost, no obligation. Logan DeGrave, Certified Financial Planner. Thanks so much for taking time to be here on the Guided Retirement Show once again. Thanks for having me. Always good to have you on here. You know, it's uh, from a certified financial planner's perspective, I think it's interesting to understand how you see the proper elements of a financial plan, especially a financial plan that is working for somebody that is leading up to and not just to retirement, but also through retirement. There's a lot to it. And there's a ton to it. And it doesn't just start when you retire. Because at the end of the day, someone that's 25, 30 years old, the way that they're saving to their retirement plans, as you said, will dictate where are they going to take their money from in retirement? What's the taxes going to be on those dollars? So it's not just, hey, I'm 50 years old. It's time to start planning for retirement. No, you got to start when you start saving. Yeah, I always say that you shouldn't put money into anything until you know what the rules are to get it out. Yeah, but Dean, I thought a 401k never got taxed. <laughs> and people think that Social Security is not taxable either, right? And I think that our industry did a disservice to a lot of people early in their careers where it encouraged them to simply look at that 401k as their retirement vehicle and start saving into the 401k as soon as possible, especially people that started saving into those 401ks post 1997, which was the year that the Roth IRA became available. And then subsequently the Roth 401k became available. And so explain to our viewers and listeners, Logan, the difference between the traditional 401k plan and the Roth 401k plan. Yeah. So the traditional 401k plan is the most popular plan. And generally speaking, most of the people that we see have the bulk of their assets in it. And what happens is you put money into that 401k and that money's never taxed. So you don't pay tax on it at the time of the contribution. And it grows tax deferred for up until 59 and a half if you want to take a withdrawal. But if you don't do anything at 73 currently, you got to start taking those required minimum distributions, which is when you actually have to start taking money out of that IRA or 401k and pay the taxes. So everything that comes out of the traditional IRA or the traditional 401k is treated as ordinary income. So taxes such as federal and state taxes apply, but no FICA tax. Yeah, but Dean, why would you care? Because when you retire, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. That's, that's what the, everyone tells you. That's what everybody tells you. But you know what I've seen? It's not true. 36 years, almost 37 years of doing this. And that's what they taught me early on. People are going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. Tell them to put their money in a tax deferred account. Then we started specializing on working with people just that are headed to retirement or in retirement. And we soon realized many, many years ago that if somebody's going to have the same type of lifestyle that they had while they were working, they're not going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. In fact, in some cases, people are actually in a higher tax bracket in retirement. Dean, I have a client that I worked with. He just came on, so not long. And I was showing him, hey, look, in about seven years, your projected income, because that's what our planning software has the ability to do is say, hey, you know, with these projections in about seven years, this is what your taxable income is going to look like. He was in not only one higher bracket, but two higher brackets than he's ever been. And he was at a loss. He goes, how did this happen? And I said, well, 
Bob, you did a really good job of saving, but unfortunately, you did too good a job of saving to your 401k, and that first required minimum distribution is going to be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And it's probably more money than he actually needed to spend when you tack on he has Social a pension Security and every too. pension. And so, yeah, so, so his income, Dean, was it, we were projecting it to be depending what that distribution around three hundred thousand dollars a year. He goes, I never made more than two hundred when I was working. Yeah, so he painted himself into a tax corner because he didn't have somebody coaching him early on that he should be saving some money to the Roth for, portion of his 401k. Well, and let's talk about, let's go back to your point there with the Roth. So with the Roth, what we're going to do is we're going to pay the tax now when we contribute, okay? So why is that a good thing? Well, that money's never taxed again, and it grows tax-free for the rest of your lifetime. But why do people not want to do that, Dean? Because you have to pay the tax, Okay. And you say, well, when, is, when should I do one versus the other? Well, hypothetically speaking, if you are started working or maybe you're in a lower earn income year, you want to do the Roth. Let's prepay that tax now. Now, if you're someone, maybe you're even a single filer and you're a high earner, you might want to look at the, the tax deferred because you get to defer those taxes. But without a proper financial plan, you can't answer those questions. Right. And you're exactly right. You can't. Because it's going to be different for everybody. So there's really no blanket statement, except for the first one you said. I think I agree with that. The younger you are, when you're in your lower earnings years and you've got a longer time for that money to compound, the Roth IRA definitely well, makes the and, most sense. And you get, used to, you get used to paying the tax up front, right? Because you know, if you switch that halfway through your career, it's painful on what you take home. So you said something, Logan, which is really at the heart of what I want to get to here on today's podcast, and that is... If you have a true financial plan, a real financial plan. And so let's talk about the elements of that plan. And let's talk about how you go about helping people build that plan. It all really starts with a conversation, doesn't it? Well, yeah. So the, the first part is it's their financial plan at the end of the day. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to understand who those people are, what's important to them, and what they want to do and what they want to accomplish. Or in other words, what does their money or resources need to do for them? At the end of the day, that's where we want to start. Because without that, and you said something when we were getting ready for this show, and it hit me, is you know, you go out to your 401k or that retirement calculator, and you just say, hey, I just want $5,000 or $6,000 net a month in retirement. Am I, am I on track? That's not a financial plan. What makes up that five dollars or $6,000? Dean, what about health care costs in yeah, retirement? Yeah, that's huge. What about taxation? That's huge. Those are the two biggest wealth eroding factors facing people in retirement, are taxes yeah. and health care. So until you truly understand someone, you don't know how to build that plan. So once we get some information about them, we put in some goals. And, you know, this is an exercise we probably do with our clients every couple of years just to, you know, make sure we're staying on track. But then we're going to see what they have, right? What, what are their resources? Okay, what do we have for Social Security? That's obviously a big component of that plan. When and how are you going to take Social Security? is a huge decision. Dean, you've done a lot of research. You've written a book on it. It's, I mean, how big can an impact be on that plan? Well, the typical couple age 62, if you assume the same earnings history, the same life expectancy going forward, they're going to have somewhere between six and 700 iterations on how they can claim their social security. And the difference between the best decision and the worst decision oftentimes is in excess of $100,000 of additional social security that'll come out over the same lifetime. But you know what's really interesting about that? When we look at Social Security and a financial plan, too, we're not just looking at Social Security in the vacuum of Social Security because, Dean, what does that also change? Your taxation. It, it changed your taxation because Social Security is taxed different than any other source of income in retirement. So we have Social Security. That's going to be a piece of the plan. Okay. Then we're going to have, are there any pensions? There's, you know, those are kind of a dying art, but we still run into them. You know, a lot of government employees and things like that. So... When and how are you going to take your pension? Are you going to have a survivor benefit? Do you have a lump sum? You know, what did we see last year with the interest rates? Obviously, a lot of lump sums went down. They work right. inversely. So how does that pension constitute things? And what happens if one of your spouse, spouse were to pass early? Well, that's going to dictate pension, survivor benefits, Social Security with a higher earner. Taxation. Taxation. Because you're going to be in a higher tax bracket with at a, at a lower income level. So- you think about another component of that financial plan is insurance, right? When we start working with a lot of retirees, that mortgage is little and the kids is big. The kids are big now, so maybe that same life insurance that they had isn't necessary. But what did we just talk about? Well, if you don't have the insurance 
plan, how do you know if one spouse passes at 65 or 70 and the other spouse lives to 90 that you have enough? You, you don't unless you've done a plan. You, you're going to guess, right? Um, but always the smaller Social Security check goes away, and it could be that a pension gets cut in half, or maybe it doesn't continue on to the surviving spouse. So, But if you have that plan where you've projected, here's all the income sources going, here's both of you living a long, happy, healthy life, and then here's what happens if somebody passes away early, does the plan still succeed? Can you still continue to do the things that you want to do? And if you can't, then that means that you need to carry some insurance into retirement for some period of yeah. time. So what you're talking about there is kind of that self-insurance is making sure that you don't need insurance and you can you know, let it lapse or whatever it may be. So, But another thing that can destroy a retirement is somebody gets sick and the surviving spouse, the spouse, the healthy spouse, cannot take care of them any longer. And so they wind up with long-term care expenses. And so you have to stress test the plan for that as well. You ha and, and people should never just go out and buy long-term care. They should understand what is the risk if somebody goes into a nursing home, how does it impact the survivor? How does it impact the legacy objectives? And if the survivor and the legacy isn't greatly impacted, you may say, I'm self-insured. I don't want to do it. Well, and you think about when you're insuring, it's not sometimes just long-term care because what we do, what do we know about life insurance? It's the only insurance policy that you'll ever buy that if you hold it until you die, you'll get more money out of it than you ever put into exactly. it. Exactly. So there, there's some planning that goes into that. Okay. Let's just move down the list. We haven't even talked about investments yet. We'll get there. But what about estate planning? Well, yeah. What's going to happen when you pass away? What's going to happen when your spouse passes away? Where do you want the money to go? Do you need a trust? Most people do. Most people want to have some sort of control. And a trust, a lot of people think that a trust is only for the wealthy individuals. A trust is for, it, 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 if a good trust is for when you're alive and when you've passed. Why when you're alive? Well, because it's got all of your directives in there. And if, in the event that you become inca incapable of making financial decisions, the trust dictates to a successor trustee how you want your financial affairs handled. Well, let's let's just talk about real life examples here that we see unfortunately quite often with some of our aging clients. Maybe they're slipping, they're not as sharp as they were and you know, we do have that financial power of attorney in those meetings. We're starting to have those conversations to make sure that you know, we understand what's going on. But Dean, we can't have those people in those meetings and talk to them without that document. Right. It's not as simple as, "Hey, this is my son Bob. Yeah, you can. He can talk to you on my behalf." No, it's not how it works. And you know, let's even think about we're talking about retirement plans, but let's just even broaden this to financial plans too for the couple that's in their 30s or 40s. What about guardianship provisions for the kids? Yeah, you know, that's always something you got to think. It's not just as, as simple as, "Yeah, mom and dad get them." You know, right. something happens to us. So. Those and that and that estate plan needs to be updated or at least reviewed every couple of years. Well, let's think about this. So you you think about your estate plan, you think about your wishes if when you pass. Well, there's certain different types of accounts that there needs to be an overlay with taxation on that as well. IRAs and 401ks being two of them. IRAs, 401ks, but think about, you know, if you want to leave some money to charity, you don't want to leave the Roth to charity. No. Why the Roth we, is tax-free. Right. Why would we do that? So you know, think about step-up in basis and those taxable accounts. So you really need to, it's not just as easy as, hey, I got to trust and I don't need to worry about it. You know, 30% of my money goes to charity, 70% goes to kids. No, what accounts go where? Right. And if you do that, what you just said under the SECURE Act 2.0, and you have the trust as the beneficiary of your IRA, it becomes a non-eligible uh, d designated beneficiary. And that means that the money is going to be forced out over a 10 year period, whether or not that's your surviving spouse or whatever, that having the trust as a component, a charity as a component of the trust messes up having a trust as a beneficiary of an IRA or a 401k. So what you're saying too, is that you need to review your estate plan and also your beneficiary designations every single year as things change. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, just think about this. Beneficiaries need to be reviewed on a regular basis. That's part of your financial plan, right? We never want to talk about the fact that we're all mortals and we all have, you know, we have no guarantee that there's going to be a tomorrow. But I've witnessed multiple times where somebody has had a 401k, they got a divorce, they remarried, 
and they put their kids on uh-huh. as the beneficiary of the 401k, but they never had their new spouse sign a waiver that says that they waive their rights to that 401k. Person that owns the 401k passes away, kids try to claim it as the beneficiaries, and guess what? If there's no spousal waiver that's been signed, that new spouse is going to get that money, and there's not a darn thing that the kids can do about it. There are so many complicated rules when it comes to beneficiaries for IRAs and 401ks that people just don't know, and it causes all kinds of problems. Well, and you're also kind of hitting on the point of you know that trust is important because you just said kids. You know, what happens if, let's assume they did get the waiver signed, and let's say the kids are 25. Do you trust your 25-year-old with half your assets? You're smiling because you have kids, and you're, and <laughs> yeah. you're thinking about there's, that, right? And, and way, the way my trust is written, there's no way. So they, they, those are the type of conversations, too. Yeah. So you have you started out, Logan, with talking about what are your wants, what are your wishes, what are your dreams, what do you want to do? You need to talk about how often do you want to replace a vehicle, where do you want to go on vacations, how much healthcare. are those vacations going to cost, health care. You want to talk about inflation. How, inflation, how often are you going to replace a vehicle? I may have already said that. Um, what, what about home repairs? You know, how old is the roof on your home? What, how old is the HVAC system on your home? Those things all need to be taken because those are the surprise expenses that hit us from time to time. And while you're working and you know you've got the known income source, it's easy. Once you get into retirement, if you haven't planned for those unexpected expenses, those can actually deteriorate the lifestyle that you wanted to have during retirement. It's a good point, though, Dean. How do you plan for those unexpected expenses? Put them into the plan. Well, but think about it. There's unexpected expenses that you don't have in the plan. And that's why when you do financial planning, what we like to talk to our clients about are what are the worst case scenarios, right? What are the things that can derail your financial plan, if anything? And we talk about probabilities of success, right. okay? And for us, we always tell our clients, look, if you're at a 99 or 100% probability of success, we're robbing you of something. Right. Think about this, because you can spend more, you can give more, you can retire sooner, right? You're overfunded to, for the lifestyle that you you want to talk or about. Or you could reduce risk in your portfolio. Okay. And a lot of different things and those, do. and those type of people, that conversation is usually a different conversation. It's hey, you just told me that you don't want to leave $4 million behind the kids, but you just told me you're not going to spend any more money. So something has to give there, right? We can't just stay on the same trajectory we're on because if we do that, you're going to leave this much money behind the kids you said you don't want to, and then I just robbed you of the most precious commodity we all have potentially, which is time. Yep. Okay? So when you're going through that plan, there's a lot of those honest conversations. But what I was going with that is, let's think about this. If you're at a 99, you know you have wiggle room. Okay. Let's explain what that 99 means really quickly, because when we say probability of success in a plan, we're running a thousand different simulations uh, of lifetime. Okay. So it's, it's taking all of the historical data that's ever been kept on the asset classes and it's mixing it up and it's given us a thousand random lifetimes. If your probability of success is 99, then that means your plan could survive the worst of the worst of market conditions, higher inflation, et cetera. It doesn't need to because all those things aren't going to hit at once. If you're at a 90% probability of success, which is on the high side of what we call the comfort zone, then that means 90% of the time – from a historical perspective, you could have gone through retirement getting the raises that you wanted every single year using the inflation rate that you built in and never have to adjust your income. There's a 10% chance that you may have to make a slight adjustment to your income at some point in retirement, yeah. right? So being at a 99 is why it's saying that's, that's not, it's too, it's too high. So let's sacrifice. Let's think about someone that's doing this themselves, potentially doing the financial planning themselves. And maybe they're using an online calculator and they're at an 85% Dean. And they're just have one goal in there. That is what they're, they want to spend $6,000 net a month. All right. right. So I would challenge that in a few ways. One, the basket, what's your inflation rate? On which part? Exactly. Because <laughs> what- the basket of goods at the grocery store, even though they're inflating like crazy and they have, they're still not going to inflate like college and healthcare long term, right? Are you pre-65 where we may have to go out and get private insurance because we're not Medicare eligible yet? But someone that has that and they're at an 85, you're telling me that $6,000 net a month includes things like home repairs or car replacement or um, the Probably hot water not. heater? No. Probably not. Because- 
they're not thinking about that stuff until it happens right. until it's the the aha moment and they oh man yep right and that's and that's when or they didn't calculate inflation properly into their plan right you, look the financial plan done properly looks at what you want the rest of your life to look like looks at the resources that you have today and marries your life to your money for probably the first time ever for a lot of people where you then as a certified financial planner, once you understand all of the resources that a person has and what they want the rest of their life to work look like, that's when you can start to perform the art part of financial planning. Cause there is an art to financial planning. There's also a science to it. The science is the numbers and the math. The art is the good certified financial planner really coaching somebody through and educating them on the right decisions to make. Well, and you said coaching, and sometimes that coaching is harder than other times. And let's talk about, I think this leads into what we haven't talked about a lot yet, and it's the most critical piece, in my opinion, of financial planning, and that retirement planning is tax planning. Oh, for sure. Well, we said at the beginning, healthcare and taxes are going to be the two largest wealth eroding factors in retirement. But, so people think, though, that taxes are just a matter of fact. They think that uh, it is what it is. The tax code's what it is. I have no control. But that's not true. So in retirement, it's the first time in your life you can begin setting the chessboard of what your taxes look like. And they say, Logan, well, what do you mean? Well, in January, if I know what you're going to take out of an IRA account, I know what your income's going to be for the year. If you have Social Security, I know what your income's going to be for the year, right? These are variables that we can control. It's not like when you're working and maybe you're an hourly worker. We don't know if you're going to work overtime. We don't know what exactly is going to be. But Dean... Let's think about this. If you know what your taxes are going to be in the future in retirement, why would you not begin setting the chessboard early on, five, 10 years out from retirement to have the most success or pay the least amount of taxes over your retirement? Let's just let's just use a real live example here, Logan. Let's just say that you've got somebody, they've recently retired, and you know that based on their social security and distributions from IRA plus dividends and interest and things that they're still going to have say $20,000 left in the 22% bracket. But you can also look forward and say when required minimum distributions start, all of a sudden you're not going to be in the 22, you're going to be in the 32% bracket. Why would you not go ahead and maximize that 22% bracket? Take that $20,000 out of your IRA and convert it over to a Roth IRA so that you can start getting and, some tax free growth. That's there. what I said why the coaching's hard sometimes. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, when you when you talk to clients about this and they retire, they're like, oh, I, I want to have my taxes low. It's the first time in my life I have at least low taxes. But we can't be short sighted. We can't just look for a one to two year period. We got to look for the five, 10, 15 year periods that you're talking about because I will tell you when you do tax planning, it is going to be painful at times. You know, I have clients that have paid four or $500,000 in taxes over long-term tax plans, prepaid them. Right. And it's painful. But we know that, hey, every dollar we can pay at 10, 12, and 22%, if they're going to be at 32 in the future, why wouldn't we? Right. Well, and, and you can quantify that with a plan, Logan, by saying, if you don't do this tax planning, here's your total lifetime tax bill. If you do this tax planning, here's your tax savings. And you see a lot more financial plans than I do these days, but I've seen my fair share over the last 36 and a half years. The tax savings by having a CPA in the same room, sitting down with the certified financial planner and the client a quarter of a million dollars in tax savings over a lifetime for somebody that's got a million dollars safe for retirement is nothing. No, yeah. we, we see numbers much higher than that. Well, you start thinking about this too, and you say, well, how, how do I set myself up for success with that? And you look at it, and it's you have to save to different buckets of money. So let's talk about that. Tax diversification. Because when you retire, that person I talked about earlier that just retires with the 401k, there's not a whole lot we can do. Right, because you're gonna have every dollar we take out is ordinary income. But what you want is that diversification piece of you. You want a taxable piece or a brokerage account, a bank account. You know that that type of bucket that we can get to that we just have capital gains, dividends, interest on. Yes, the tax deferred is going to be a piece. That's your 401ks, your IRAs, and then yes, we want the the tax free bucket. We'd like to have all of our money there if we could. But the reality is, if you don't have money in that first bucket, so when I say cash or brokerage account, taxable money it's really hard to do Roth conversions. Because if we do a Roth conversion, Dean, and we owe $20,000 to the government, 
Well, where we're going to get, get the it? money from, yeah. right? Now, you can withhold the taxes from the conversion. It's not as good. It's not as, it, it's not as good. It's not as powerful. It still works in some cases, but it's just not as powerful. So I, I think that that's for anyone that's listening, and it's, well, I'm 35, I'm 40. I don't need to really start worrying about retirement. You do. You do. And yes, the Roth is great, but that having that taxable piece gives you a lot of flexibility. Let's let's talk about something else that we run into a lot. Someone is fifty-two years old and they've saved enough money to retire, but they have an issue. All most of their money, if not all their money, is in 401k. Okay. So we know the rule of fifty-five, we know seventy-two T, right? We know all these different things. But hypothetically speaking, you want to not take money out of the IRA until you're fifty-nine and a half. So you don't have any penalties. Right. But if you have that brokerage account, that taxable bucket, or even that Roth bucket, we know we don't like spending that Roth bucket if we don't have to, that can set you up for an earlier retirement, right? Because you can bridge that gap from 53 to 59 or 53 to 55, whatever it may be. And there's been a lot of times I've sat down with people and because they lack of tax diversification, they couldn't retire when they wanted to. So let's see if we can put a bow on this for people, Logan. So you've got somebody that you know them now, you know their story, you know what they want, you know how they want to live, you know you've taken into consideration all the, the potential future expenses, you've factored in inflation properly, you've done the forward-looking tax plan to mitigate taxes to the highest degree possible, you've maximized Social Security through proper Social Security planning, you've got the estate plan done. You've maximized a pension if it's there, and and you've looked at whether or not they need to carry insurance into retirement. Those are all the components. Now you're going to review the resources, and based after you've done the complete plan, now you get the answer. What does my money need to do in order for me to be able to do all of these things? That then drives how you invest the money. Yeah, and I think that that kind of says a lot about what we do here because we've been talking for 25 minutes plus about a financial plan and we didn't mention the investments one time. You can't talk about investments as part of the plan until the plan is completed because you have no idea what the money needs to do. If all you're going to do is talk about investments and if you're working with an advisor that's all they do is talk about the investments, then you're going to make all of your investment decisions based on two very strong emotions and those are fear and greed and your plan is going to be based on a plan of hope, and it's not going to work. You know what I think is really cool is when you get a good financial plan done and you can actually show a client how much risk they need to take to give them the best probability of accomplishing the things that they want to do. Right. Okay? Because, Dean, when is when? how many people that we sit down with, maybe a handful a year, they say, you know, my main goal is I want to grow this money as big as possible. Never. Maybe one or two people. Your but, uncle? <laughs> the the, re, the reality is that for the most part it's we yeah i want to spend time with my family i want to spend time with x y and z i want to give to the kids whatever it may be so when it's re, pretty pretty powerful when you can put that on the screen you can say look anywhere from like 40 to 70 percent stock to bond so you could be 40 percent stocks or 70 percent stocks that level of risk you have the same probability of success so then that's a deeper conversation of if the market stresses you out and you don't sleep well when we have years like last year, let's go to that smaller risk level because yeah, we still exactly. have the same probability of success. Exactly and right. And that gives a lot of people the ability to exhale. And because, yeah. you know, sequencing a return risk, not to get into that on this show, but that's a real thing, right? If you're taking 5% out of your portfolio, 6% out of your portfolio, because maybe you're not on social security yet, and you're truly portfolio dependent, well, if your account goes down 20%, you took out a lot more than 6%. Well, when you start having that conversation and sequence of returns, if you utilize a strategy, a, a bucket strategy, along with uh, a, 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 a dynamic withdrawal strategy, that can mitigate the sequence of return risk. And here's, here's what I mean by that. So you should typically have about two years worth of desired withdrawals in something very, very safe in your account. That's your short-term bucket of money within your account. Now, it could all be in one account, but you need to earmark sure. this piece. This is my short-term bucket of money. You're going to have some that you're going to say, this is my three to seven or eight year money. So I can be a little bit more moderate with that. And then you can have your bucket of money that's out there that's eight to 10 years plus. And when those buckets of money that are moderate or more growth oriented have a better return in a given year, 
harvest that return within the account and move that over to the safe bucket. Now, you, you don't want to get overloaded in the safe bucket, but yeah. that's a way that you can say, I know where my income's coming from. I know that these pieces out here are going to fluctuate a little more. It's okay. It's fine. But if you do that, combining so what, the bucket strategy so with what the dynamic. what you're saying is that someone that's going to retire in the next two to three years at this point in time, they should be should, in their 401k, they should start having, they should understand where that first withdrawal is going to come from. Where for, for, for the first couple of years. So if it's all in the queues <laughs> or all in SPY or whatever, it's time to make some changes. Yeah. Thoughtful changes. Yeah. But I think that once people understand and sequence of return, we could do an entire podcast on sequence of return. We won't get into that today. No. But I think the important part for everybody to realize is that financial planning is complex. There is an art to financial planning. There's a science to financial planning. And financial planning can very rarely be done by a single individual and be comprehensive. You need to involve the CPAs. You need to involve the estate planning attorneys. You need to involve the risk management specialists. So, and you need to involve the, the investment specialist. The, the CFP is the quarterback. Yep. They're coordinating the team to win on your behalf. So you think about this, and I had this conversation with someone the other day. It was a, it was a family friend. They do everything themselves. And I, and I made a comment to him. I said, you go to the doctor every single year for a physical, right? Why do we do that? But we want to compare year after year of how we're doing is there anything new that's arised? And we want to make sure we're all right. And then the day, what we care about when we come out of that appointment is, are we all right? Okay. Why would you not want to do that with your finances as well? To say, look, am I okay? Because at the end of the day, more often than not, people are more than okay. And they're robbing themselves of experiences in life. Exactly. And without a plan, I can't answer that question. I always think about it this way, Logan. I believe that when someone retires, they become the CEO of their own finances, right? In other words, they're the one that have the vision. They're the one that know what they want to accomplish and what they want life to look like. But imagine if I was a CEO and I tried to be the chief legal counsel, I tried to be the chief tax counsel. I tried to be the chief investment person. I can't do all of those things. No successful CEO says, I don't need CPAs on my team. I don't need attorneys on my team. I don't need financial people on my team. No, they rely on those people. So if people can simply take a step back and say, when I'm creating a good financial plan and I've got that team, I'm the CEO. I'm the one that's calling the shots. I'm the one telling you what I want to have happen, but you have to have the team surrounding you that can actually make that happen. And the interesting thing, Logan, is that the ultra wealthy people, they expect that. They expect the team. They expect to say, here's what I want, and the team to listen yeah. and act, right? The average millionaire next door does not only not expect it, they don't even know that it exists, yeah, yeah. but it does. It exists right here. Yep. I, I, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it any better. So I, I think that people, they really need to think about it that way, and they need to have a team, and that's exactly, you don't do it all on your own. No, I can't. It's impossible. And not do a good job. You could wing it, and you could be okay. Here's what I always tell people is, I know a lot about tax planning. I know a lot about taxes, right? We've spent a ton of time in it, but I'm still not a CPA. So why wouldn't I walk down the hall, three doors to Corey's office, who's our CPA here, and have him come help me out with something. Right, you should. And if your investment team or financial planning team doesn't have that ability, I'm not talking about a CPA that gets on the phone with you that you've never met. I'm talking about a CPA that sits down in the same room as your certified financial planner every single year, maybe twice a year. They have a relationship with you. It's more impactful than anything else you're going to get. Far more. Armor. Well, I think we've outlined what are the elements of a good financial plan. There's more. The deeper you get, the the more complex issues come up. But I think we've hit the high level. So I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, Logan, to join me here on the Guided Retirement Show. Thanks for having me.
You bet. All right. Great conversation with Logan DeGrave, certified financial planner. As you can see, there is a lot that goes into building a good financial plan, and it requires a team. And, with, and, and that team needs to be working in a coordinated effort. I hope that you take the time to either seek us out or seek somebody out that can provide that level of service to you. Don't forget, we're offering you access to the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients. Just get out to the link in the show notes and click the Start Planning button and begin your retirement plan from the comfort of your own home. Starting your route to retirement. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to leave a comment and share this episode with your friends. Investment advisory services offered through Modern Wealth Management, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor.